Now, I love a good bit of nostalgia as much as the next person, but you could totally argue that we're living through the greatest generation of video games and systems so far. Stunning 4K graphics, the ability to take massive open-world games with us on the go, A-list actors lending considerable talents to games that have Hollywood rivaling budgets, not to mention the whole thing is backed up by a robust and burgeoning indie scene, spreading new ideas in all directions. There is so much to love. However, it is not all sunshine and ray guns. With loot boxes refusing to go anywhere and some truly predatory monetization practices from the more nefarious publishers out there, you could be forgiven for lovingly looking back at more innocent, straightforward times in gaming. Now, I do think that the pros outweigh the cons overall today, but there are some things that the modern day could learn from yesteryear. Or at the very least, let's have a big old memory field love-in about the halcyon days of pre-2010s gaming. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are eight awesome old-school video game features we don't see anymore. Number eight, cheats. Remember cheats? Cheat books, codes that unlock infinite lives or ammo, maybe even one that lets you play as characters you're not supposed to see for another 10 hours? Crash Team Racing's Unlock Ripper Roo code, I remember you well. In what was undoubtedly the first experience of actually breaking the rules some kids had ever had, you were never really a true gamer until you had held select while turning on the power, or quickly pushed up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A to unlock a whole world of additional content. And it's here where I'm going to take a second to thank Kazuhisa Hashimoto, the inventor of the Konami Code, who sadly passed away in February 2020. What a legacy he left behind though, and the application of this code will always have a life of its own. Back to cheats in general though, as they used to be just as much a part of gaming as high scores and showing off. Action replay cartridges, exploder add-ons, even these third-party peripherals are now looked back on with nostalgia. Obviously, the reason all this stuff went away is down to unifying the experience for every player and guaranteeing that you're not jumping through the game of your own accord. Or it's because changing the rules with codes directly affects loot boxes and progression loops, but this sort of thing used to add tons of replayability when done right. Number seven, company mascots. The 80s and the 90s were a strange old time, with companies vying to outdo each other in very real, tangible ways. Pepsi fought Coca-Cola, MTV clashed with VH1, and Ronald McDonald regularly questioned the Hamburglar's parentage. Into this arena stepped Nintendo and Sega, with their chosen champions in the form of Mario and Sonic, respectively. Such emblematic characters soon transcended the actual companies themselves, and it paved the way for Spyro, Gex, and of course Crash Bandicoot, each helping create the visuals and personality of gaming as a medium. Crafting a unique character to carry your company has completely gone by the wayside, though thankfully we do have a good reason why. It's down to the legitimizing of video games as an art form, and the change of focus from a colorful metaphorical book cover to what's inside. Many of the characters who could be classed as mascots in modern gaming gain their popularity as a byproduct of the games in which they feature. Nathan Drake is not Mario any more than Master Chief is Sonic the Hedgehog, but the objective quality of the Uncharted and Halo franchises thrust those characters into the spotlight, rather than the characters themselves being the focal point. It's the best way for all of us to move forward, and in a way it gets away from the whole childish feel of having mascots in the first place. Number six, compilations of multiple games in one. Referring to the likes of the Mega Games collections on the Sega Mega Drive, multi-game compilation releases are sadly a thing of the past. Sure, you'll get some bundle deals on digital storefronts, but it's not the same thing. Because what better way to spend your cash than something like Streets of Rage? Well, Streets of Rage, Golden Axe, and Revenge of Shinobi all on the same cartridge, that is what. Sometimes packed in with console hardware but available as separate purchases in their own right, these compilation titles were a way for gamers to try genres that they might otherwise have ignored. Want to buy a football game, a racing game, and a side-scrolling shoot 'em up but you can only afford one? Well, compilations had your back. The nearest that we've got today are the likes of the Atari Flashback Classics on PS4 or the Dreamcast Collection back on the 360. Whilst these are lovingly curated packages, they're definitely geared at the retro market, rather than getting a handful of newer titles out there in a three-for-one bundle. Number five, levels instead of worlds. 
As with many entries on this list, the actual structure and framework of old school games was more a product of the available technology and processing power than a conscious creative design ethos. Think back to your favorite childhood games though, and you'll quickly be talking about levels. Games from this bygone era had very clear formulaic rules. Level one, boss fight. Level two, another boss fight. Level three, boss fight, and so on. If asked to name your favorite level in the likes of The Witcher 3 or The Last of Us though, you can't really answer the same way, as games are now measured by a different barometer in the modern era. Back then though, we could all name our favorite boss fights from the likes of Sonic 2 or Super Mario World, but that doesn't necessarily apply to God of War or Skyrim. Now, this isn't a criticism of the old school formula as some of the greatest and most beloved games of all time come from this era, and they all followed this blueprint to a T. The idea of 10 levels and 10 bosses may seem quaint and old fashioned to modern sensibilities, where online RPGs and enormous 200 hour open world adventures are the order of the day, but without this level boss, level boss structure, gaming as we know it may have never evolved at all. Number four, Couch Co-op. Even the term couch co-op only really came about in the 2010s, created to distinguish local play from going online. Handing your friend or relative a second controller, usually the cheap third-party one that's held together with sellotape and goodwill, there were so many applications of local co-op, and developers created games that played into that idea of proximity. Sitting side by side as your twin characters downed waves of enemies in beat-em-ups or raced each other in Sonic, these sensations just cannot be replicated online. Thankfully, titles like A Way Out, Overcooked, or even Brothers A Tale of Two Sons on Switch are reminding newer gamers why playing local co-op is just just the best. And yet we are a far cry away from how the industry used to think of co-op multiplayer in general. Actually, while I'm on massive props to Nintendo for nigh on mandating a local co-op mode for everything that gets put on Switch. Anyway, yes, global connectivity is awesome. I love a good five person raid and that side of gaming is just badass, but that's not the point. Why have one and not the other? Leaving Couch Co-op out the picture highlights an awesome part of gaming's portfolio that I'm sure tons of developers could innovate on better than ever given newer hardware. Number three, Stealth Games. Remember Stealth Games? The gaming industry doesn't seem to. Just looking at 2019, the genre included A Plague Tale Innocence and uh, Untitled Goose Game. Even Assassin's Creed has gone full butchery in the last few years, and from the trio of Splinter Cell, Metal Gear, and Hitman, only the latter is even still alive. Flashback to the 2000s though, and the genre was everywhere. Typically having the player get from point A to point B without being seen or heard by guards, this brand of gameplay was slow, methodical, and deliberate. It was intense, you had to plan routes through levels, and the best stealth games didn't just give you dedicated tall grass spots to hide in, but a whole bunch of ways to mess with the AI, enjoying your repertoire of gadgets or abilities along the way. Over time, hide and sneak mechanics were crowbarred into the most unlikely of games, just to ride the popularity wave as it was post Metal Gear Solid. Stealth games just don't exist anymore, and with Ubisoft putting Sam Fisher in a Skylanders-style abomination called Elite Squad, it seems that stealth itself is the farthest thing from the minds of those at the top. Number 2. Tactical Shooters Now before you yell Rainbow Six Siege and Ghost Recon, kinda, I know, I totally know, but this used to be an entire genre of first-person shooter gameplay, not just the Tom Clancy brand waving one flag and hoping for the best. Even then, while Siege is phenomenal, the last two Ghost Recon games were about as tactical and considered as a pre-roller coaster hot dog. No, I'm talking about Armor, Counter-Strike, Operation Flashpoint Dragon Rising, Conflict Desert Storm, Band of Brothers, Full Spectrum Warrior, games where the focus was just as much on how you were going to line up a headshot or flank as pulling the trigger. The prevailing shooter template today is, as we all know, the online run and gun model. Showcasing bright colors and hyper stylized bullet sponge characters in the likes of Destiny and Overwatch, the flip side is Rainbow Six Siege and Call of Duty, but that's about it. Look to the fact that the most played game on Steam is still Counter-Strike Global Offensive, released eight years ago, and you'll see just how much the mentalities behind this genre have all but been abandoned by most developers. A return of the classic tactical shooter would be a welcome surprise from more developers, as the slow, methodical, and nerve-wracking gameplay would mark a welcome change from the balls of flailing shooters that we have across the board. 
And number one, split screen multiplayer. Split screen multiplayer has to be number one because if there's one mental image that we all have from our childhoods of gaming, it's plugging four controllers into the front of an N64, assembling the spaghetti dump of cables that was the PlayStation multi-tap, or otherwise handing out multiple controllers to get the whole room involved. Maybe it's just quaint now that the only way for two to four players to play together was to literally divide the screen into halves or quarters, making it virtually impossible to see what was going on. But man, did we not care, and on top of that, it was the most fun. Sure, there was screen looking, a heinous tactic where you literally just watched your friend's screen to score a cheap kill, but they could do it back to you as well, unless they stuck to the house rules. Today, the vast majority of multiplayer sessions are played online, and the data does support that it's the way that most of us want to play. Still, I love local multiplayer, and getting a handful of people together for a Doom LAN tournament or Crash Team Racing Showdown kind of feels even more special because of how novel it is today. I encourage all of you to bust out multiple controllers and anything split screen, order some pizza and compete for the last slice. The industry might not include this stuff across the board anymore, but that doesn't mean that you can't. For now, I've been Scott from WhatCulture.com. Please let me know your favorite things about old school nostalgic gaming down below and check out the WhatCulture Gaming podcast if you have the time. Thanks very much for listening and I'll catch you soon.